Thank you for joining us at Free Keen TV. Um, today we'll be talking about the Hunting Festival. Hello and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm your anchor, Heike Corser. Pumpkin Fest, how could you miss it? This weekend played host to the annual Pumpkin Festival, which brings an estimated 50,000 visitors to Keene. The pumpkins were carved and lit, and true to form, Main Street was awash with pumpkin peepers. Each trying to pick out their favorite and enjoy a wide variety of foods and drink, local businesses were working extra hard to handle the waves of customers. Also this weekend on Sunday, the semi-annual Free Keen Fest took place at Railroad Square. Free Keen Fest has been put on for a few years now with an installment in the spring and fall. Featuring various vendors and live music, the Free Keen Festival is the place to meet the local liberty activists. Here is a short video of the two events. <laughs> discussion panel consists of Michelle Seven and Allie Havens. Allie, you were working during Pumpkin Fest downtown. How was your first Pumpkin Fest? My first Pumpkin Fest was pretty exciting. Uh, there are lots of people. At first they came in waves and then uh, and then there was just a huge influx of tons of people from every direction it seemed. and <laughs> Lots of children and people of all sorts from out of town coming in and uh, a lot of people were really excited about being in New Hampshire and uh, they all noticed that there's no sales tax and they really liked that and I heard, even heard some talk about moving to New Hampshire, just some of the wow. Pumpkin Fest visitors, so that was awesome. Yeah. So um, did you enjoy yourself? I did. Uh, I, I mean, I was working, so uh, it, was, it was hard, but... We're in the dark together. Right <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel in danger. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I think it went, I think it went well. Uh, we didn't, you know, there, there was a bit of a line, but everyone was very polite. I don't feel like, I, I didn't see anyone stealing anything. Uh, I thought it went really well. I got a chance to leave and get food and um, going through the crowds and smelling every, all the food and right. all the fried dough. And I heard the food court was quite a hit this year and um, the only downside was that the porta potties were right next to it. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> porta par the porta parties were right next to Corner News, and so, uh, oh but it w I, I didn't notice a terrible, s I even walked right by, and I didn't really, but they were really crowded, because there's so many people, and um, right. a lot of, of beer drinking. Mm -hmm. well, I, I heard that there were 130, hello, <laughs> 130 um, arrests that day, for mostly for vandalism. And that um, the biggest culprit of the uh, a lot of the problems were the uh, state school. King oh, King College. State. Yeah. And then I um, didn't I didn't notice it that much. I, I know people are saying that, but I didn't notice lots of belligerents or anything like that. No. Um, I don't know if they were just if it was. It's hard for me to imagine having seen everything. Uh, having you know been in the crowds, to it's hard for me to imagine that that many people were being belligerent. There might have been that many people drinking in public, right. but uh, it, it seemed largely peaceful to me yeah. just when I was there. But I was kept inside the store, so. 
You know, I've I traveled and lived all over, and, and I am pretty good at adapting to my environment. And one thing is that I feel really safe here in, in all of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. So I leave my door unlocked, and I'm really liberal about, you know, things and and um, including my purse and what have you and I um, I did have two hundred dollars stolen out of my out of my pocket um, while I was I had got up to go to the restroom um, at a restaurant and it was you know, it was a crowded bar and everything and and um, yeah I had three one hundred dollar bills that were folded up that I put in my pocket prior to going and they were nice enough to leave me one what, did you, so it was a pickpocket type thing? It yes. wasn't, you know. Yeah, wow. but I mean, I'd been sitting at the bar, you know, for a while and things like that. And so, I don't know. I just, um, that's just not something that I would ever imagine happening in our community. Yeah, well, it doesn't, Pumpkin Fest crowd, as you know, <laughs> doesn't really affect the New Hampshire community yeah. so much. It's a lot of outsiders, a lot of people right. commenting on different prices of things and how things are so much less expensive in New Hampshire, especially cigarettes. Ever. Which is a, why I'm sure the state wants to bring them in to, uh, to spend their money. Mm -hmm. And I don't blame, I don't blame the city for wanting to put this event on. I wonder if they made any money, considering there were only like 15 or 16,000, 15,000 pumpkins this year, which is like five or 6,000 less than what they'd expected, I mm. guess. Well, I know that they were talking about canceling Pumpkin Fest f uh, just for a little while. The people who had it last year, I, from what I heard um, from local business people, that they were planning on canceling it. And so a lot of people that might have come maybe thought it was canceled. Mm. So that could have had to do with, you know, I, I heard it was not as busy this year than it was in previous years. It is funny though to think that the city spends this money that is extracted from the taxpayer in order to seduce uh, people into coming and spending money in the community. I, I don't know, it's just, yeah, I'm, I I'm wish that private clear. industry was putting this on like with sponsorships or things like that, just strictly um, the businesses and, and uh, private Yeah, I'm, I'm not totally clear on what parts of it are um, we were it's actually the talking city earlier. Pays with all the police. For all, well, yeah, the police <laughs> definitely are. Uh, security is this, uh, uh, paid security. for by the <laughs> paid for by the taxpayer. But uh, I know that there's talk of next year possibly uh, private business taking over Pumpkin Fest and sort of making it more efficient and cleaning it up. And they will obviously undoubtedly do a better job. Yeah, I, I guess would we'll say see so. if that happens. Well, cool. I guess. Thank you, Michelle and Allie. This past Friday, individuals from the Occupy Keen movement held a demonstration at the local Bank of America branch at Central Square. Free Keen TV was there to interview the participants and capture their story. Take a look. Hello, this is Derek Jay reporting from Occupy Bank of America in Keene for Free Keen TV this October 21st, 2011. A sunny autumn day in Keene, New Hampshire, finds a group of individuals outside a local Bank of America. It's Occupy Bank of America Day this October 21st, 2011 in Keene, New Hampshire. These people have had enough, and they're doing something about it. Taking to the streets with pamphlets, urging the passers-by to move their money out of bailed-out banks like BOA and into local credit unions. Their message is peaceful. They played music and sang songs of solidarity. A pervading thread among the protesters' reasons for the depression is the banks of privilege who collude with the federal government for special favors. Tully Fitzsimmons. Okay, Tully, it's a pleasure to meet you. And what brings you out here today? Well, uh, we're operating in anticipation of November 5th, which is Bank Transfer Day, where we're asking Americans to move their money out of the large, uh, bailed out, fee-laden corporate banks and into local banks and credit unions. My ultimate goal here is to change the financial and legal and political structure that permits a corporate domination of electoral politics. I'm a very strong believer in civil disobedience. Why did you choose Bank of America of all of the banks in Keene? We chose Bank of America first primarily because of their new announcements of $5 fees on debit cards, $8.95 fees on deposits in some accounts, um, and the fact that their executives, the top seven executives, are still continuing to sell bad assets to the Federal Reserve 
continuing to use taxpayers' money to bail them out, and they just seem to be one of the most egregious institutions. I made it very clear to the people involved in this protest, we were not going into the bank, we were not going on their property, we were not going to cause a, a riot. We were talking to customers in the public square. We're off bank property, cars are driving through as they exit the um, as they exit the drive-through, and I can talk to them that way. How is the public receiving your demonstration today? Incredibly well. I mean, everyone that I'm talking to is coming out of the drive-through of the Bank of America, and I've I've spoken to over a hundred people so far this morning. Every single one of them is upset with the bank, with their practices, with their fees, and with what's been going on at the bank. I'm an economics professor, and so the role of the banks and the Fed um, and the credit crisis on the American public is my particular interest. Okay, so as an economics professor, what's the ideal situation you would like to see for the general public? The, well, the ideal system would be no such thing as a bank that's too big to fail, okay. instead of protecting. Okay, and who's doing most of the protection? Well, the Federal Reserve has been propping up banks, guaranteeing uh, them funds, creating money and infusing cash into the banks. The, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank bought bad debt that the Bank of America bought, knowing they were buying bad debt in the first place. And they worked together. And it's all taxpayer financed. The public received the message well. Some signs earned so much attention, the cars were pulling over on the side of the road to take pictures. These demonstrators are sending a message to individuals to move their money into local businesses. November 5th, we're going to have a bank transfer day. There's an organization online called Move Your Money, which is encouraging people to move their money out of the big banks that have been so problematic and into local credit unions and local banks, which also has the added benefit of pouring more money into local economies and less into the global economy. I'm Nancy Brigham. I came to uh, talk with the uh, people in front of the bank here and see what they had to say. They pretty much uh, are advocating that you put, take your money out of the big banks and put it in uh, credit unions or smaller banks. So I think it's a, a good move. Everything's peaceful. Uh, I haven't seen any, any uh, hostility at all. Would you support a person's ability to opt out of a federal government with which he disagrees? Uh, that's only moral, right? Uh, I would say the government has uh, it regulates the, uh, the banks and anything the banks are doing is because the government let them. What brings you out here today? Tired of corporations running my life. And my roots go back to my great grandfather fighting at Bunker Hill back in 1775. At the time back then, the large corporation was, was Britain occupying Boston and telling them how they were going to pay taxes and where the money was going to go. And right now we're faced with the same problem. Uh, uh, one of the local uh, police officers came up and told me that he had a call in a report that uh, I was uh, on the walkway when the light was green. Do you feel like you were really endangering yourself or others? No. So I think it was just someone who didn't agree with the message. We're allowing them to make their decisions based on corporate lobbyists. That's on us. We're the ones that have to make the change. We have to get money out of politics. We're the ones that have to sit down with the people in Washington and tell them no more. This business that corporations are people is nonsense. If I can get one person a day to start thinking about what's going on in Washington, I'd be just tickled. I'm working for change. And what brings you out here today, Brett? Well, I was sent up here to uh attend the uh, demonstration and make sure that things stay peaceful and no uh, property is damaged. How are things going so far today? Very smoothly. Uh, everybody is very cordial and uh, very uh, very peaceful. But I'm very impressed with this little community uh, and I'm happy with you know all the people that I've, uh, I've met seem to be very kind. <laughs> Come on out and uh, play some drums and uh, talk with the people, occupy people. Oh, one See more. what they want. Do something with their own money that can make a difference if a lot of people do it. Because when people stand up and say no, the government has to make a choice. Are we going to assert authority and enforce it? Or are we going to back down and say our, our rules, our regulations, our approach is invalid? But everyone's going to have a different issue that affects them. And if enough people stand up and say, I won't do this, the government will back down. Come on down and join us. We're going to make a difference. We're going to change the world. This is Derek J. reporting to you live from Bank of America, King, New Hampshire at the Occupy Bank of America event.
this October 21st, 2011. What will the Occupy movement bring next? Stay tuned to Freaking TV for more as this story develops. Interesting video. What is your take on the video, Michelle? Well, I saw some familiar faces on that. Craig, who we interviewed last week, um, was on there singing his, playing a little ditty at the end, Occupy Together. And um, I saw uh, also Lauren Canario, who's an activist in the, in the community. The, the one gentleman wearing the red sweater, he was new to me, but I liked what he said um, he, when he alluded to uh, we, as a, as a group of people that live in the geographical area called the United States, um, are, uh, are, are being subject to, to basically a tyrannical sort of dictatorship, much like the, his great-grandfather and our predecessors um, were back before the Revolutionary War, which was why um, you know, colonials were, were fighting and protesting in the first place. You know, the fact that you have to be able to opt out of a government that you don't like and you have to be able to say no. And um, that's currently not the situation in yeah. the United States. I agreed with most of what he said. I thought he was coming from a good place. Uh, the only thing, he said something that I thought was interesting where he said, we need to get money out of politics. And <laughs> this is kind of a funny idea because <clears throat> You know, if you really understand money, it's not, you know, you've got politics and you have money. And money is definitely not something that you don't want to end exchange between individuals. Um, so I think the real problem is the politics, which he might not disagree with. But it almost sounded like he was suggesting that we could have uh, powerful men and separate Rulers them from the and money. Rulers and leaders, right. Um, which is something that's been proven in history to be uh, impossible because the people with the power are going to seek the money. So, you know, there's perverse incentives whenever you or have that much power. the people with the money are going to want to perpetuate having that, and so they're going to solicit well, naturally. Uh, you know, right. the government to rule in their favor. <clears throat> right, so they're that. acting in their own self-interest, mm -hmm. which is, you know, something everyone everyone does. Uh, it's false to, to think that you could ever operate without self-interest. So the bank's issue is something that I think is important and it's good to point out, but I think it's a, I think it's also important to realize that with everyone acting in their own self-interest, if they're not um, violating rights, then I mean, if you ba if you break down if your the rights, the protesters aren't. Violating? No, if I'm the sorry. the banks, well, I would be referring to the banks mm, specifically, is if they're not, you know, sending out their own security officers to come and hurt someone, or if they're not, you know, Fraud, fraud is something that, that the but banks could be accused of. they have committed fraud, right. yeah. Right. They have hurt people with the um, subprime lending that they mm -hmm. did. Selling bad, selling bad uh, mortgage-backed securities and stuff like yes. that. Yes, and now the derivatives exchanges that are, is taking place um, between primarily Bank of America with its Merrill Lynch, I think, is a subsidiary. And, um, and you know, in, initially when... President Bush and then uh, Obama were talking about bailing people out. The concern was about the average Joe who mm -hmm. had, um, you know, who had bought themselves into uh, indentured servitude basically by by purchasing homes they couldn't afford at the top of a market, leveraging, you know, their their lives basically, mm -hmm. not putting enough down or not paying for it outright. You know? Right. Everyone was trying to make money and flip homes and, and um, people that ought not to have been buying did so and um, the banks facilitated that with you know asking for no um, for none of your the loans to be backed by collateral or anything so it's really bad terrible debt and why would you want to put money in savings in a mm -hmm. bank like that right exactly and and the bringing up the whole the new fees that was mm -hmm. Bank of America starting yes. to impose that's uh, that's something interesting to me because it serves as a clue that there aren't necessarily customer uh, customer service oriented as far as that goes that they know that they can get away with imposing these fees mm -hmm. and the people that will pay them will make them some money and the people that won't pay them well if they go under again then there might just be another bailout so they can get away with stuff like that you know right because 
most like places behave children that are rewarded for being bad you know, right by how much can naughty. they get away with right right because I mean what what you're a mom Michelle so I don't know if you'd agree with this but do, you know from what I, I remember from being a child that there's always those limits you push and you, you would find, I remember in class when we'd have a substitute teacher who just didn't really, <laughs> you know, know to, if, you know, if, you she was letting, if she was letting kids get away with all kinds of stuff, then people would push and see how much, how much I'm going to get away with. Right. Now, if the government is, is allying with the banks, um, then what you create is a fascist system. So the so the private interests are going to push the government to see or push really their customers to see how much they can get away with and with Which the government being the, the only customer. right with mm -hmm. the with our terrible court system there's you know there's no accountability for well, them as far as right. there have been lawsuits but like the last time a big bank was uh, Citigroup got sued mm -hmm. I was reading in New York Times um, there was like uh, Which is owned by a Saudi Arabian couple hundred million dollars they had to pay and then the bank bailout came so they got paid that back and some. Right. So I mean whether or not they realized that after they took the loss or after they were sued or not I'm not sure but if because the, the government was the one holding the suit so. Well you know um, Guy Fawkes Day is November 5th and that is the day that has been called the bank transfer um, move your money day there's actually a Facebook uh, page called Move Your Money, I believe, and, and it's formerly being called Bank Transfer. I will be transferring my money out of Bank of America. I've been a member there for, um, gosh, like 20 years maybe, and um, the problems to me didn't really start. I mean, I suppose we could go back to um, 1913 or something like that with the Federal Reserve. We can loop everything back to that in so many ways, but the, um, the uh, USA Patriot Act. Uh, back in 2000, I think it was uh, ratified October 26, 2002, was an, the first time. That was really when I started feeling the problems with Bank of America. I had just sold a home and all the money went from escrow into my Bank of America account. And um, so there was a lot of money in there. And I went to withdraw $10,000, which was the price of all three of my kids' ski instruction and tickets and everything. It was going to Squaw Valley um, uh, that year, and um, I was told by the bank in, in Lake Tahoe City in Lake Tahoe that I needed to give them two days' notice, and that if I insist on taking my money then, that they could have me arrested, claiming that I was making a run on the bank. I said, but I have several hundred thousand dollars in there. Why can't I have my money? I'm concerned about this. This idea of having a run on the bank, <laughs> yeah, like right. like that should be some kind of crime. <laughs> you know, I, I am doing you a favor by lending you this money mm -hmm. so that you can, you know, use that, because they only have to have 10% reserves. 90% of the money that they lend out to people is they don't even own. Right. They, they can't. They're the, leveraging the, also. And any mm -hmm. bank that doesn't do that, any bank that tries to be principled and only hold money that he actually has in its mm -hmm. reserves is going to go under because they're at a they're they're competing with banks that can that have these special rules around them. So Well there are there is something called the Weiss rating and you can look that up, W E I S S. The Weiss rating, um, they rate banks and basically uh, there was only one in California at the time when I lived there, uh, and it was a savings and loan, a farmer's savings and loan. And there was interest that you could actually get on your loans, and it was a, or on your um, savings. And uh, but you could, you, in order to be um, a customer with that bank, you can never have bounced a check ever. Mm. And you have to keep, you had to keep a minimum amount of money in there, which was I think it was at least twenty thousand dollars, and you you could only withdraw money. You had this, you know, voluntary contract because they wanted to be able to lend money out and and what have you. So, um, but they just were able to take the cream of the crop in mm -hmm. terms of customers, and right. they could you know guarantee you know offer those kinds of services to them. Yeah, well, ex exactly. That that's uh, that's a good point because. You know, most people don't have the best credit. Uh, so, you know, borrowing money, paying it back a little late, that's commonplace in society nowadays. I mean, right. if the government's doing it, then of course everyone else is too. It's just sort of part of our system. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the system I was talking about, fractional reserve uh, banking, is something that 
all banks sort of participate participate in like all of just like the local banks are going to be doing and of course all the big banks so I think there were nine banks initially that George Bush um, kind of strong-armed into um, into signing Wells Fargo I think was one of the last ones to uh, sign the uh, agreement to the bailouts even if you if the bank didn't want to be bailed out it was pressured by the then president and the uh, and the feds actually. Well, now I hear a lot of banks uh, sort of boasting about how they didn't take bailout money, which I, you know, to, I to, to a bank. lot of <laughs> to a lot of people that's that's encouraging. Yeah. Like, oh, well, you know, you were able to succeed without having to take taxpayer Stolen money, money, right? That's a hallmark of a good bank. If you need taxpayer money in order to survive, then you know these too big to fail institutions. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I like what Lou Rockwell says, let failing banks fail. Yes. Let anything that is failing fail and make room for the things that can actually be successful. You yeah, know? If, if, if an industry is dying because it's not, you know, for whatever reason, it, unless it's because of some, uh, you know, the banks have been regulated by the government for a while, so it's hard to say in those situations why. But, um, but if, if they're failing, then it could be based on something like charging people fees for having, you know, for wanting to take money out or depositing money. But something that could be really uh, useful in the future, and I think it's inevitable, is for people to turn to hard money or gold and silver. Yes. Um, because it's, you know, we might not be carrying, you know, gold and silver coins everywhere, but, you know, we could still have the paper money, but it would represent you know, right. it would represent some How much form silver or something that you have in an account somewhere. Right. So that rather than having this paper fiat money that really is worthless, you know, then you actually have a commodity that mm -hmm. is... Um, and you don't have to worry own. about some company or some government um, inflating, inflating or spending, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, it's finite. You can't just, you know, manufacture more gold or silver. Right. Because they have testers for that. So the price fluctuations would actually um, be dependent on supply and demand rather than an, in, an artificial supply and demand that the government is using. Right. Well, I liked um, what the uh, gentleman said uh, when, um, toward the end of the video, if people say no, the government will back down. I like that idea. You know, I like the idea of people saying no and opting out and standing up for freedom, standing up for liberty, and declaring yourself to be a, uh, a human being and, by definition of human, be free. independent, mm -hmm. free. Yeah. I agree. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, did you uh, do you have a bank account anywhere? Uh, I am at the credit union, um, but we should turn to Heike. Okay. Thank you for joining us tonight. As always, contact Freekeen TV by sending an email to Freekeen TV at, or I'm sorry, TV at Freekeen.com. I'm Heiko Corser saying good night, Keen. <laughs>